not quite Alex Jones this Friday. I am your guest host, Holland van den Neuenhoff. I'd like to thank Alex for having me on as his guest host today. It's my pleasure. I uh, drove down here to Austin from Oklahoma City yesterday in order to uh, host the show. It's uh, been a while. It's been several months since I first had the opportunity to guest host the Alex Jones show, and it's always a lot of fun. And I'm looking forward to a good time today. Today we're going to be talking a lot about Benghazi. That is in the news. And what they're talking about in the mainstream media is not exactly what occurred at Benghazi, what we need to be talking about regarding Benghazi. So we'll be talking about that a lot. And we'll also be taking your calls. I believe Friday is first time Friday or first caller Friday. So we'll be taking your calls later. I'm really looking forward to engaging Alex's audience one-on-one -on -one and seeing what they think about my performance here. Anyways, uh, of course, my name is Holland van den Neuenhoff. Um, I uh, have uh, been on this show a couple of times, a number of times over the, over the past couple of years, mainly, of course, regards to the work I've done on A Noble Lie, Oklahoma City, 1995. That uh, documentary is, of course, available in the info shop. And uh, it's the uh, expose of the Oklahoma City bombing. Um, Oklahoma City, uh, a noble lie, Oklahoma City, 1995 is the uh, correct title. Uh, and we spent a number of years compiling that information and in doing so, uh, developed our own little viewpoint on false flag attacks and talking to people on the inside as I have in my associates in research and writing. We have talked to some of the main players involved in these operations and we've come to a realization of how these operations are executed on the ground. So using that lens, I'll be applying it to current events and what may have happened or not in Benghazi, and of course, with the Boston bombing of which InfoWars has been on the tip of the spear, literally breaking that story wide open. Something Alex and I have been talking about for a while now is the evolving curve of the information war. Not only are we unraveling these attacks immediately after they occur, we are unraveling them as the official script is being laid out. We are now actually dictating terms to the elite regarding the narrative they want to give to the American people. That was a battle, what happened after the Boston bombing, an info battle, and guess who won? We did, the truth seekers, because truth is on our side. We don't have to make the, anything up. We don't have to remember our lies. We simply have to tell the truth. So uh, that was a tremendous victory, historical victory, and hopefully one that will dictate the course of future actions. Of course, if you want to check out uh, A Noble Lie, uh, go to the Info Shop. It's a two-hour documentary about the Oklahoma City bombing. And learning about that, it's not just learning about ancient history. First of all, some of the same players are still involved right now. Of course, Eric Holder being the primary one. He's now Attorney General of the United States. He uh, was responsible, initiated, and uh, supervised Operation Fast and Furious and has taken, uh, I'm sure, a hand in many of the false-like attacks that have occurred since that one fell apart. Eric Holder, back in the late 1990s, was put in charge of the investigation into the Oklahoma City bombing at the behest of the federal government for the, the Department of Justice. And obviously, we saw where that direction took us and how Eric Holder made his bones covering up for the elite in the very beginning of his career in government. I'm sure he had already been vetted before that, but he definitely made his bones after the Oklahoma City bombing, specifically in covering up the torture murder of Kenneth Trentadue, who was a prisoner in federal custody, mistaken for John Doe number 2 by the FBI, and tortured to death. Eric Holder supervised that cover-up. That's who we're dealing with, people. Many anthropologists and archaeologists believe that before man even discovered uh, the power to harness and use fire, we were involved in agrarian activities. That is, taking the seeds of plants and then replanting them to produce more. The very foundation of our modern civilization and human culture is centered around the planting and cultivation of edible plants, fruits, vegetables, nuts, you name it. And the globalists have been going after gardening. They've been harassing people that have gardens in their front yards or their backyards. They've called for licenses for people to have gardens because you can't trust prisoners in the police state America to be able to grow their own food.
That's why I've come to the realization that we need to become self-sufficient. You need to be informed. You need to have the Second Amendment to protect yourself. You need to be politically active to wake up others. You need to filter your water. But you also need to plant a garden. Even if you live in an apartment, you can do this. If you live in the countryside, obviously you can do it on a grand scale. There are so many green belts in areas uh, that humans don't even visit uh, nearby cities and in suburbs where people are now more and more planting their own little private gardens and meadows and off the side of the road. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a revolutionary act to unplug from the television, to unplug from the computer and all the globalist propaganda and to go out in your backyard or your front yard or planters at your apartment or on the roof of the building where you live and to plant a garden. Here are some of the amazing deals at InfoWars Seed Center at InfoWarsShop.com. The Survival Seed Vault by My Patriot Supply features only the finest survival heirloom seeds for a robust and hardy garden, even in the toughest of times. The ARC All-in-One Seed Kit contains 70 varieties of 50,000 seeds of fruits, vegetables, medicinal, and culinary herbs. All ARC seeds are heirloom. Each type is labeled and sealed separately for ease of use and longevity. The Deluxe Emergency Seed Bank combines three of Emergency Seed Bank's top sellers, the Family Survival Emergency Seed Bank, the Medicinal Herb Seeds Pack, and the Culinary Herb Seeds Pack. We also have starter varieties of the deluxe seed packages for fruit, salad, salsa, peppers, and medicinal herbs and more. Go to the InfoWars Seed Center at InfoWarsShop.com. A little seed can grow a huge tree that produces fruit for up to 50 years. We have the best life bombs. That's what these are. We have the best weapons against death out there at the lowest prices waiting for you to lovingly plant them and lovingly grow them and lovingly eat them and share them with others. We will strike back against the New World Order and this is only one more initiative in our fight against them. So please join us at InfoWarsShop.com or you can link through at InfoWars.com at the InfoWars Seed Center. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm your host, Holland Van de Noenhoff. It is the InfoWars store where you can check out A Noble Lie. Go check that out. Uh, your support is very important. Um, I'd like to comment on that. You know, I've uh, come up to the Info operation here in Austin a couple of times. And I doubt there's another talk show host in the world who's employing, you know, as several dozen people as uh, Alex is. I don't even know what the number is. But uh, every single one of these people, you know, they are relying upon the support of the community, which is supporting Alex in his endeavors to expose the truth. So that is why your support is important to keep us going, to pay the bills literally of the operation so we can continue to spread the word and continue to be a thorn in the side of the globalist elite. What Dan Badandi did in Boston when he shut down a press conference of the governor, the entire world was watching that press conference. And immediately after, when he mentioned a false flag attack, guess what the world did? When they shut down that press conference, he went on Google, they went on Google, and they started looking up false flag attack. That was people across the world who saw that endeavor waking up. That is what they're doing here. That is why your support is very important. Uh, today, like I said, we'll be taking callers later on, but I'd like to get into a little of what Benghazi is going on there, the implications, and compare Benghazi perhaps to the most recent terrorist attack that has struck this country, the Boston bombings. When you look at Benghazi, uh, four Americans killed, including a U.S. ambassador, that compound under attack for hours. For those of you unaware of my background, I served the United States Marine Corps in the infantry. Uh, not long after the Benghazi attacks occurred, I received a call on my own show, Radio Free Oklahoma on the Logos Radio Network, which is on Monday evenings. And it was a former Marine himself. I did not know him, but he was calling in. He had worked security, uh, embassy security for the ambassador, Chris Stevens, in Jerusalem. And he expressed confusion, amazement that there was no military relief while the embassy in Benghazi was under attack. Because I had brought that up on air. I was like, I served in the Marines. I know how embassy security operations work. I have many friends who serve in that capacity in the fast company anti-terrorist team who respond to attacks on embassies and also embassy guards themselves. And I can tell you this, 
that had that been a legitimate affair, a simple, if the crowd was simply mad because of some YouTube video that was produced in California several months before, um, there would have been a military response literally within minutes. It's on, it's, it, Benghazi is right on the coast of Libya. There is a carrier group sitting in the Mediterranean. We have bases all over the Middle East, all over Israel, all over the region, in Italy, across the, across the water. Had that been a legitimate affair, I guarantee within minutes there would have been helicopters circling over that, over that embassy with the Marines boiling out, armed to the teeth. That's not what we saw. What we saw was the embassy for the United States, the most powerful empire in history, in recorded history, under attack for four hours by 60 members of a so-called mob with no relief in sight. One of the telltale signs of an inside job or that the fix is in is the lack of military or security response when normally there would be. And when an ambassador for the United States is under attack for four hours, there should have been massive military response. And there was zero, which tells you someone gave a stand down order. Someone wanted those people to die. The information coming out of Benghazi is very interesting. It turns out that, of course, there was a weapons pipeline being run out of Benghazi. Those weapons that were used in the Libyan so-called revolution were now being shipped over to Syria, where they're being used now in Syria to fulfill our current foreign policy objectives there. Perhaps the attack had something to do with that. There also has been conjecture, informed conjecture, that the Benghazi affair was supposed to be a... It was actually a public relations ploy, which turned into a fiasco because apparently the thing is, that theory is that they were going to pull off kidnapping the ambassador and then the Obama administration will pull off the master foreign policy coup of recovering the ambassador. I don't know if that's true or not, but the point I want to make is, is when you come up with these grandiose false flag attacks on paper and you try to execute them on the ground, that's two very different things. What they taught us in the Marines, that a plan never survives the first contact with the enemy. And that's usually true. And with these false flag attacks, for the most part, the covert arm of U.S. intelligence can rely upon the mainstream media to cover their tracks. It's not like when people criticize so-called conspiratorial thinking or what I like to call the counter-narrative, the argument often is, well, you know, the government is so incompetent, they can never pull this off. Well, you know what? They are incompetent and they can't pull this off. They, do, they, they mess up left and right. I see it left and right. Um, but they can rely upon the mainstream media to not connect these dots. Even though many of these anomalous facts may be reported at one time or another, it's never packaged for mass consumption when it's time to feed the story to the public. It's never put into the official narrative. And so that's what we're seeing with Benghazi. We're seeing the mainstream media basically complicit with the administration in what appears to be a horribly botched operation. In the light of the Boston bombings, I'm beginning to think that their uh, learning curve is nowhere near the information revolution's learning curve. They seem to not be learning their lessons. What we saw in Benghazi compared to Boston was there are several di uh, dichotomous facts. One, of course, uh, President Obama hesitated early, early on to label what happened in Benghazi an act of terrorism. Uh, when by definition, any stretch of the word, it actually is uh, terrorism. When you have a, a crowd that's mad for whatever reason, storming an embassy, I mean, that's happened before in American history. And it was called terrorism then. Why is it not terrorism now? Uh, with the Boston bombings, you had the, the initial manhunt, of course, which was botched. And they later settled on to the two Chechen brothers. But you saw a manhunt for specific individuals. In the case of Benghazi, there was no talk of bringing the perpetrators to justice. None at all. The Obama administration is not talking about bringing the attackers of Ambassador Stevens into court or bringing them to Guantanamo or anything. There is no, it's not even on the table to seek justice for Benghazi. Because even trying to open up that can of worms and let people to learn even more about it might lead to that story blowing wide open and what actually happened. Now, the congressional Republicans right now are digging into Benghazi. It's probably not for truly uh, 
altruistic reasons, we can be sure that party politics has a reason to play, uh, but we can utilize this to our advantage and find out what they are finding out about Benghazi. Now, I don't know if they're going to take it all the way. Probably not. Usually these investigations by partisan politicians do not take the investigations all the way where they need to go. But we can still discover information, and the Republicans right now are on it. As much as the media is trying to downplay Benghazi and act like it's ancient history, in many ways they're trying to say it is. But it's not, because it is the current administration. It deals with what is happening in the Middle East, and what exactly were they doing in Libya? Now, the, the truth on this event will come out. Eventually, we live in the age of uh, information. There are no more secrets. All mysteries are revealed. Um, but are we going to be able to connect the dots on the information and make positive choices? Or are the American people going to forget about the case by the time the truth comes out? Because that's usually how it is. By the time the truth comes out, the case is forgotten. There have been nine or 12 other more interesting things happening in the news, at least the news playing up these things to uh, distract people away from what is really going on. By the time we discover what really happened in Benghazi, we will have moved on to nine different scandals and... Uh, that is their game plan, at least, and uh, it will not impact what is going on. But the information revolution is not just about revealing information, reporting information. It's about acting on information, using that information to affect our choices. And if we act on the information that the administration lied about Benghazi, is lying about everything else, is lying about the Boston bombing, and if this partisan effort, if it is mainly partisan, I'm, I'm going to give the Republicans the benefit of the doubt on this because they are uncovering some good stuff. Uh, if they can take this investigation to where it needs to go, because where it needs to go, frankly, I mean, I know where it needs to go. But uh, where it needs to go for right now is the Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, resigning or being tried for treason. Because she is ultimately responsible for what happened to her ambassador, to her embassy, on her watch. Her signatures on the papers pulling down security from the Benghazi embassy. There was no good reason for that. When Al-Qaeda is flying the black flag of Al-Qaeda over whole towns in Libya, why would you be decreasing security at your embassy? There is no good reason for that. There, I, that was before the age of sequester, and the budget certainly allowed. In fact, there were special forces uh, uh, officers saying that they offered to uh, supplement State Department security of the embassy facilities there, an offer which was turned down. They actually turned down offers of assistance for security because obviously they were planning to breach that security at Benghazi and pull off some kind of public relations stunt that obviously went very wrong. Once again, we're not saying the government is all powerful and they control everything. They try to. They try to. And they can rely upon the mainstream media to not hold them accountable. They mess up all the time. They messed up this. They messed up Boston. And you know, you know what? The more mistakes they make, better for us because they expose themselves. I had tried everything. I'd cut back the amount of food I was eating. I was lifting weights and jogging, but nothing was working. My body was literally starving for minerals and trace elements as well as key vitamins. And as soon as I had that, I immediately could eat half of what I was eating previously and be satisfied. Now, there are hundreds of great products at InfoWarsTeam.com, but I want to point out the three that have helped me lose 37 pounds in just two months. Products like Beyond Tangy Tangerine, Pollen Burst, and Rebound. When I started taking the Tangy Tangerine and other products every day, I lost more than 37 pounds in just two months. Now that's results. I want to challenge my listeners to go to InfoWarsTeam.com and to order just three of their products, and you will see the changes in the way you look, feel, and in your appetite almost immediately. Start your journey to health and wellness today. InfoWarsTeam.com. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I am not Alex Jones. I am guest hosting today, May 10th, this Friday. My name is Holland van den Neuenhoff. I am the writer and producer for the film documentary, A Noble Lie, which you can get at the InfoWars store. A Noble Lie, Oklahoma City, 1995. The definitive expose of the Oklahoma City bombing. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with that work, let me assure you that uh, 
Our sources are first-hand sources. Our witnesses in the film are police officers, victims, family members, survivors, investigators, people who are directly involved in with what happened in Oklahoma City. And the things they saw were at a direct variance with the official narrative being dictated by the government and the mainstream media. This is a theme seen time and time again. People on the ground, first responders, seeing things that are directly contradicting what the government is saying. Now in Benghazi, we're seeing the same thing. We have Gregory Hicks, the number two man in Libya. In fact, when Chris Stevens, the ambassador, was killed in the Benghazi affair, Hicks became the number one man in Libya. His questions, his testimony about questioning what he was seeing regarding security, what the official narrative was, he started questioning the official narrative of the Benghazi attacks. And for that, he was demoted, made a desk officer after being a, you know, a service officer for 22 years. And in his own words, he was uh, basically they let him know that his line of questioning was unwelcome. Now, if we are to expect a full and open inquiry into what happened at Benghazi, what we're seeing is the classic uh, precursor to persecuting whistleblowers. And of course, the Obama administration, uh, contrary once again to its word and to its campaign promises, has been uh, probably, at least in modern history, uh, the most energetic in prosecuting whistleblowers who work for the government, even more so than President Bush. Uh, and you know, all of the, the liberal sentiment behind the Obama administration, I can even respect genuine liberals who are, are perhaps are collectivists and believe in socialism. If you actually believe that, oh, I, I can respect that viewpoint. But if you support the Obama administration, I now know that uh, you don't even mean what you say. The Obama administration is not even liberal or progressive, or it's not even socialist. It's fascist. It's a warmongering extension of the corporate of the corporate regime. That and he's basically, like I said, replicating the first two terms of Bush and all the celebrities and rock stars out there who are still supporting the Obama administration. Look at what is happening. Compared to what is happening with this administration, the actions that they are doing with your ideals and with your sentiment, and if you cannot reconcile the two, one or the other needs to go. You can't have both. Regarding Benghazi, we're seeing the lies left and right. And I'm opening up the phones right now. The phone number is 1-800-259-9231. I repeat, 800-259-9231. Please call in and we will engage the audience. Now, regarding Benghazi, if you go back to the beginning, you remember that they blamed it on a supposed YouTube video. And for that reason, this crowd in this one location in Benghazi, the only location in the world where people were getting mad about this video, they just happened to attack the embassy and kill the ambassador. Now, of course, I'm a, a filmmaker myself. I work in film. So when I looked at the so-called YouTube video, the, the Benghazi video, I don't even know what the title is, that supposedly inflamed the crowd that caused these attacks, Within about two minutes, I realized oh, this is not a film. Uh, this is not even, there was no way someone was trying to sell this to anyone for investment. This literally is a PR op. I could tell by looking at it that that is not a product that anyone was trying to take seriously. And surely not the crowd in Benghazi. The, the film or the so-called film, the video, is basically unwatchable. And uh, it makes no sense. And that is not why the crowd at Benghazi decided to attack that embassy. That is a cover story and a very weak cover story. And I mentioned before that, of course, the Obama administration was not, was, at first was reluctant to, to regard the Benghazi attacks as terrorism. Why is that? Because they don't want, don't want the anti-terrorism apparatus that they have helped build up, inflicted upon themselves and asking questions, of course. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm your host, Holland Vanden. We're off this May 10th, Friday. Looks like uh, we're going to go back to our caller, Mark from Texas. Hello, Mark. Welcome to the Alex Jones Show. You were saying that you had purchased a couple of, a copy of A Noble Lie. Is there anything else? Yes, sir. And what, what bothers me is nobody's even ever heard of this. And um, I have passed it around. I even sent it to another talk show. I don't know if you ever heard of Lynn Willie. Uh, talk show it's here in Texas. Also. I guess not. I think probably, and because I want people to, you know, to understand that this stuff is real. 
I didn't used to believe this stuff. I used to think, ah, it's all nutcases, conspiracy theories. No. And if, because I tell people, look, you can Google police officer Donald Browning. Mm -hmm. You can Google the late murdered, by the way, uh, officer Terrence Yankee. Mm -hmm. um, and also recently the late, um, what's his name? Heidelberg, Hoppy Heidelberg. Hoppy Heidelberg, yes, of course, who passed last yeah, year sorry. also. I, I'm sorry we lost him recently. You can Google those things, and you can see these are not these are not fly by night uh, witnesses. These are people who really were there and seeing what happened, or were personally threatened, as was Hoppy and of course the uh, police officer uh, Browning. Um, yeah, exactly. Like I, I said when I, I was saying earlier in the show, I mean we're not we're, we were talking to the actual people involved in these events. Police officers who had their lives threatened by FBI agents. Don Browning was on the Infowars show not long after release talking about the fact that in police headquarters, um, Don Browning, an Oklahoma City police officer, one of the first responders who helped save no, lives. Heard, heard yes, he was confronted by an FBI agent who told them that he and his wife might lose their lives if he continued to ask questions. That is the caliber of people we are dealing with. We are dealing with simple thugs who threaten the lives of innocent people if you ask questions, we're seeing that being played out also here also in Benghazi, where people who ask questions are having at least their careers threatened now. And if they keep on asking, even more will get threatened. Uh, Mark, is there anything yeah, else? And, yeah, and I, and I also tell him, by the way, that Officer Browning, forget just the fact he was a police officer, yeah. but he's a fact he's a Vietnam vet, Marine Vietnam vet, mm -hmm. actually a rifleman of Vietnam. So, mm -hmm. you know, and I try to tell people, if, you, if, if Oklahoma was a false flag, Everything that's going on now, the shooting at Newtown, the shooting in Colorado, in Aurora, Colorado, mm -hmm. and other shootings, and including what happened in Boston, you can believe is a good chance the government is behind it. Stop admiring the FBI. The FBI has become a criminal organization, as is the CIA. It's unfortunate, but this is what's happening. And by the way, did you ever hear of uh, William Cooper? Yes, I have. I'm reading a book right now. Uh, called uh, Behold a Pale Horse. Mm -hmm, the famous book by and, William Cooper, yes. Yeah, and in it, he writes, this is, many, remind, he uh, wrote this book in 1990 now. Mm -hmm. He predicted a lot of the shootings and stuff. As a matter of fact, he said they already happened and blamed it on CIA mind control, including using drugs such as Prozac. If you want, I can read you page 225. Oh, that's right all right. I, I've actually read the book, and I'm sure uh, many of our listeners have, but they can definitely look that up. It's uh, valuable to uh, reference that. I thank you, Mark. For calling in uh, to the to the uh, Alex Jones show, thank you very much, and also for your purchase of a noble lie, and of course spread that around. And this is something that I, I will relate to the audience, and time and time again, this is what I was striving for with a noble lie. What we were striving for was for that product to be a wake up tool. And I have had more than one person come to me and tell me that they were able to wake up stubborn members of their family or their friends who were, were unable to grasp a lot of the information, but seeing it laid out in the way it was in a noble lie allowed them to make the conclusions that can only be gotten from a sober examination of the evidence. So it does serve as a valuable wake-up tool, and, and in that I am glad. So I thank you, Mark, for, for uh, checking out a noble lie, for spreading the word, and for calling in. Excellent. Well, thank you for calling in, Mark. We have a number of callers on the line. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, like I said, I thank you, Mark, for bringing up that topic. When you verify that at least one event in American history, like the Oklahoma City bombing, was indeed a false flag attack, that did happen. Um, and then you ascertain the fact that no one was held accountable, no one in government was fired, no one was held accountable for treason, for mass murder of their own citizens for, for, for perpetuating that attack. And I'd like to clarify some things. When I say inside job, that it was an inside job, it was. But it's not that every street agent on the scene is involved in a cover-up of the fact that a criminal arm of the government blew up its own facility or blew up its own people to affect a political agenda. It's not. And that the people on the ground, and that's what you see in the use of these military drills. Like in Boston, you saw the men in the black hoodies and the khaki tactical pants and the desert boots with the same uh, backpack as the Chechen suspects, obviously there was a military drill, police drill in effect at the time. Now, the purpose of the drill, which is the common denominator many times to these false flag attacks, is twofold. One, it allows the movement of assets 
into place. It provides a plausible deniability and security for those assets that they're moved into place. Oh, we're just part of an exercise or a drill. Number two, after the fact, after it goes live, after it blows up, after their casualties on the ground that they weren't expecting, the players were not expecting, it, the drill effectuates the cover-up because now all the people involved in what they initially thought was a legitimate law enforcement or military operation are now complicit in mass murder. And they're going to keep their mouth shut. And if and that's even if they care to report it. For the most part, all the people on the ground are covering up what they expect and what they think is simply a massive foul up by their agency, which, of course, happens time and time again. And let's not uh, leave it out of the purview of government employees to cover up their own mistakes. So the drill is twofold, to move the assets into place and to help effectuate the cover-up after the fact by letting all the law enforcement officers or military officers involved, let them know, oh, by the way, this is part of an operation, but it's top secret and you can't talk about it. Of course, I'm not making that up. We saw the same thing after the Oklahoma City bombing, something that's not in a noble lie was the fact that several police officers on the scene who first responded were sequestered, uh, brought together separately by FBI agents and told that there was an undercover operation going on involving the Ryder truck, involving what happened in Oklahoma City, and for security reasons, Zero. ongoing undercover operation, you cannot talk about it. That is the security at work. They use that cover story time and time again. And the one thing I have delineated from my study of government false flag attacks is that they will not vary the formula if it's successful. There's no reason for them to. Um, if it works, they will keep on doing it. Almost to where it's, uh, it loses, I'm sorry to put it this way, but it loses its originality. They literally use the same standard operating procedure every time because it works. Well, it's going to keep on working until we hold them accountable, until we put enough pressure on the mainstream media to keep on asking those questions that are going to make the government uncomfortable. And until that happens, they're going to continue doing things the same way. But I think after Boston, they may, they may have to change their methods of operation because Boston was very sloppy. Benghazi was very sloppy. Maybe they're losing their edge because they're not competing with the truth anymore because they can rely upon the media to just cover everything up. I don't know. But they're not very good these days. And I don't want it to be that way, but it is. And viewing the lens of Benghazi and the Boston bombings through what I've discovered firsthand with the Oklahoma City bombing is amazing. I have interviewed firsthand uh, players in the Oklahoma City bombing, members who, who were involved with uh, the neo-Nazi right back in the mid-90s. One of those men, Johnny Bangeter, informed me that prior to the Oklahoma City bombing, he was in Las Vegas area at the time. He was being approached by an informant who was asking him to bomb a federal building with ammonium nitrate and Tovex boosters. That does sound familiar because that's exactly what played out several months later on April 19th, 1995 in Oklahoma City. This guy who was approaching Johnny Bangeter, pitching a script, literally pitching a script, which later played out. Now, the spooky thing about this, this man who was pitching the script was an ATF informant. So we have his direct proof of the ATF using their informants, selling the OKC script around the country to various neo-Nazi groups until someone obviously was foolish enough to take the bait. So you see the fact that they are approaching people before these attacks, trying to get them to effectuate these attacks. We've seen this in the war on terror. Time and time again, when the, the so-called the Christmas tree bomber and other incidents that were almost forgotten now because of these larger events. And what you see the SOP is the FBI sends an informant to approach, approach some confused kid who's working at McDonald's. And he talks to him over some uh, so-called jihadi website, which of course is a CIA front. And this young kid is talked into jihad, paid to do it. They pay for his apartment. And they put him on the no-fly list so he can't get away from his handler who is freaking him out. He tries to get a job in Alaska, so they put him on the no-fly list so he can't get a job. So what does he have to do now? He has to ask for more money from his FBI handler. He's now even more under control. And later, of course, that FBI handler hands him a cell phone and tells him to blow up something. So he dials the number and is arrested. He's thrown in jail for the rest of his life. And the war on terror is given more justification for its existence. So these operations are happening all the time. 
all it takes for an operation for something real to happen, a real bomb, is to take one of these existing, always existing, always ongoing sting operations, and instead of putting in fake explosives, like they say they do these times, put in a real bomb, like they did at Oklahoma City, and watch it blow up, and watch every agent on the scene scramble for cover and start coming up with cover stories, because they, they may not exactly know what happened, but they know they'll get in trouble for whatever happened. So they're going to cover themselves. So the cover-up after the fact is also not based upon universal knowledge of the attack. Everyone is covering up everything for their own reasons. And that's probably where we're going to see at Benghazi. Uh, let's go to our next caller. we got a number of callers on the line. Like I said, this is Friday. I'm the guest host uh, in place of Alex, and I like to talk to his audience. So let's go to Steve from Costa Rica. Hello, Steve. Oh, hi. Great. I'm glad to meet you. It's uh, wonderful to get on talking to you guys. Um, yeah, I, it's just amazing how people just aren't being aware of the, the corruption that's going on there and these false flags. Things are becoming so obvious that it's it's just phenomenal that they just don't get it um well, a lot of them do get it yeah. but uh, it's not in their interest to talk about it well i don't know they're being lazy or something you know i'm doing everything i i can from down here because i talk pretty crazy myself and and you know i'm doing the youtube stuff and well, when you live in an radio. insane world being a little crazy is probably not an entirely bad thing well, my, what the what the Chicos call me down here is Gringo Local, so I, I might have deserved that in some respect because they know I'm not your normal Gringo down here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, but I'm, it takes a while to get a little respect down here. But one of the things too with with this whole corruption stuff and and and, and this whole banking structure that's has affected Costa Rica, which I'm really so sad to see, is the last two presidents have borrowed so much money billions and billions and, and hundreds mm -hmm. of millions of dollars from these same banksters in, in Europe that have been repossessing Greek and Cyprus that are going for Italy, Spain, Portugal, and they're going to be coming here. They already done it to Stockton, California. They repossessed Stockton. People don't understand. They took their, they're taking their pension funds. You know, when, when are they going to wake up? These exactly. What's happening in, what has happened in Europe, what has happened in Greece, what they tried to pull off in Iceland is just a precursor of what they're going to try to pull off Cool. We're not asking people to make uh, fantabulous, uh, you know, inventions here. Just learn the lessons of very recent history and apply them to what's going on today. What they pulled off, what they tried to pull off in Iceland, what they're pulling off in Greece, Spain, Italy, is what they're going to do in this country when the bill comes. We are no different and we are not immune from history. Anything else? Peace, 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 like a cancer. It's spreading like a cancer, not like a virus. So that goes too fast. Then piece by piece, and they're going to consume everybody, and they're going to consume this poor country too. And 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 these people know it down here because there is austerity down here. Everything has gone up. The cost of living, although it's a heck of a lot cheaper than the United States, but still, in in their respect, in their economy, everything has gone up, and the locals don't like it, and mm -hmm. they're pretty upset. With the president, you know, she's one of the first women presidents, and mm -hmm. and she got a. You got bought off by the United States. Because they well, that's what happens. That. I mean, uh, Costa Rica is definitely within the sphere of influence of the United States, and they're not going to allow an independent to run that country for too long. I thank you for calling in, Steve. Great. Good talking to you. Have a great day, then. Awesome, awesome. I have a lot of friends who have decided to go the expatriate route, who are in Ecuador and Costa Rica and other countries. I don't blame them at all. I mean, if you want to go to Costa Rica, I fully sympathize. I'm sure it's a beautiful country. I myself was born in this country and I've already made a name for myself saying the things I do so it's already too late for me to run and it's not in my nature anyway. But I fully understand those people who flee tyranny that is happening in this country, who have seen history and seeing it playing out again in this country. You would be a fool to not read the signs and take action. Either get out or go to battle, one or the other. I'm not uh, passing judgment on those who get out. I think you're wise to avoid what's going on in this country. I perhaps am not the smart one for sticking around and fighting it out, but uh, then again, I can. it's not the first time I've been accused of that. Anyways, we're going to our next caller, John from Texas. Welcome to the Alex Jones Show. Hey, what's going on, Buzz? I, I really appreciate what y'all guys are doing out there, and uh, keep spreading the word. You know, I ain't going to sit here. I ain't going to run either, you know. Um, 
I, I, I look at it and uh, and I already know what they're trying to do to us, and mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm not uh, I'm not dealing with it. You know, I'm not having it. But uh, I just got some breaking news. This is the reason why I'm calling because you know I'm an everyday listener. My first time calling. Excellent. But uh, I got some breaking news. Uh, uh the te- the Texas bombing. Uh, mm-hmm. the West Texas bombing. Are you talking about the no, I, fertilizer I got, I got, plant in Waco, Texas? Is that what you're referring to? Yes, sir. Okay. But, uh, I'm looking at my news just now. It's, I got I got recorded it and everything. I got footage of it. But he caught a guy, and he said uh, at first he was talking about oh it was the fires, and then he caught a, the EMS guy, and he. Okay, uh, you say he caught the man. Is that caught on uh, private communications between first responders? Is that on the news? No, no. The uh, he said that he caught the guy. Like federal, he got federal agents got this guy now, and uh, he's an EMS guy. EMS or EMT, one of the two. Mm-hmm. Um, his name is Brian something. McKnight. I got the video. I'm well, yeah, the video. we have the article online right now on InfoWars. I'm looking at it right now. So it looks like there is some developing information in that investigation. I was uh, wondering exactly how that fertilizer plant exactly went up. Being on fire doesn't necessarily mean it'll explode. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm Holland Van Den Orenoff, guest hosting this May 10th. All the callers uh, callers on the line, be patient. I will get to you as soon as I can. Today we are discussing, uh, as a direct topic, the uh, information coming out of the Benghazi attacks on September 11th of last year. We can cover other topics, of course. There's a lot of other topics. I really want to get into the fact that the State Department has shut down the 3D printing plans that are being distributed, that they're uh, citing an international arms control treaty to shut down a website that's distributing plans on making a gun, printing a gun on a 3D printer. Of course, Alex has had Cody Wilson on, on the show in the past talking about this new evolution in manufacturing. The fact that uh, now engineers are going to have more power than politicians. I think that's a new good trend. I've had my dealings with a number of uh, politicians over the year. I've not been impressed with their IQ. However, engineers, I'm fully confident, can uh, pull off their plans competently. And the latest news coming out of uh, Cody Wilson and his enterprise, his endeavors, is that the State Department has shut down his website and its distribution of files that allow 3D printers to print up the Liberator handgun which is a ABS plastic handgun that can be made entirely from a 3D printer minus the nail, which you can buy at Home Depot, as a firing pin, a weapon that fires uh, apparently most popular pistol caliber. It's based on the Liberator pistol from World War II, which is a one-shot pistol dropped behind the lines to the French resistance. The idea being that you took the Liberator in your hand and you walked up to a German sentry, you dispatched the sentry with your Liberator, and you took his weapon, and now you were armed to fight the resistance. Cody Wilson has invoked that name for the Liberator and his new principal handgun. And the State Department has struck back by shutting down the website and its distribution because apparently uh, foreign users are offloading or downloading those files and that violates some international arms control treaty. So we're seeing the pushback on this gun control fight. Now, what Cody Wilson and his people are doing is circumventing the whole political process by conventionally which they restrict and control our behavior through taxation, through laws, through bans, through prisons. When you can print up whatever you, whatever is your heart's desire, if it be a gun, it really doesn't matter how many pieces of paper are written on, or how many words are written on a piece of paper signed by the governor. That is not reality. What is happening on the ground is reality. And now... We're going to be able to see the capability to manufacture your own weaponry. Now, some people may be predicting some kind of Mad Max chaotic world in such an event, but it's not too much different from what's going on now because you can purchase basically whatever you want. You're just going to be able to circumnavigate government restriction on your freedom. 
So perhaps the new fight for freedom is not going to be in the halls of state capitals of the White House of the Congressional Building in D.C. Maybe the uh, future fight for freedom will be in laboratories, be on computers. And actually, I think that's what's happening now. We see a lot of people on the edge of the technological revolution are freedom-oriented, directly so, involved in the fight. We see it. We want the hackers and engineers and, and technological gurus on our side because this obsolete system that they're trying to keep in place over us, controlling our behavior, is obsolete. They're refusing to come to grips with it, and now they're striking back by trying to ban things, like with the State Department banning defense uh, distributed from getting these plans on how to make guns out there. We can fight back. Welcome back. I'm Holland Van Denonoff. Let's go to our next caller, Greg from Colorado. Hello, Greg, and welcome to the Alex Jones Show. You're speaking with Holland Van Denonoff. Welcome to the show. Hello? Yes, Greg. You're hey. on the air. Yeah, I'm here. Um, I got a question I haven't heard anybody um, ask, and one of the battle cries seems to be Quo Bono, who benefits? Mm-hmm. And on all the uh, guns and yes. ammo shortages and stuff, it seems like the gun manufacturers and the ammo manufacturers are benefiting. And I wondered if anybody had traced up the ownership of the gun manufacturers and stuff. Well, that's a very good question, Greg. And what you're seeing actually is a pushback from uh, many players in the gun industry, including Magpul out of California and other companies, PTR out of Connecticut. They are pulling out of their home states where they were founded, where they conduct their operations, because their state governments are restricting their ability to sell their products. That is an admirable and noble effort on their part to Absolutely. exert effort to get away from there. We're seeing other gun companies who are being strangely silent. Now, I'll give you a hint as to the gun companies that are being strangely silent in this fight. They also receive hefty government contracts for the war on terror. Remington, HK, FN, those are the big gun manufacturers in this company. And the reason they are big is because they are making M4s and squad automatic weapons and M240 goals for the U.S. military for their war on terror. They, that's where the real money in guns is, is government contracts. Not selling Ruger deer rifles to Jim Bob in Oklahoma City, okay? That is not a major money industry. It, it's, it's money industry, but it's not anything compared to the money and the connections that are being forged with the major gun manufacturers that are dealing in government contracts. And those gun manufacturers have been strangely silent in this gun control fight. Maybe they don't want to jeopardize their government contracts. So if you really want to look into a conspiracy regarding the gun manufacturers, look into the gun manufacturers who are making their money off selling guns to the government. Awesome. Thanks for answering my question. You're welcome, Greg. And thank you for calling in. Let's go to our next caller, Scott from Missouri, the Show Me State. Hello, Scott. Welcome to the Alex Jones Show. Hi. Um, I had a, uh, some comments to make, yeah. and then I had a, a question. Um, it, it's regards uh, to uh, waking people up. Okay. And uh, consider a hypothetical situation. Let, let's just pretend for one moment that, that tomorrow on Fox News they aired, let's say, the director of the CIA literally confessing the whole operation to be an inside job. Let's let, uh, take Boston. We'll just take that. Okay. He confesses that Boston's an inside job, blah, blah, blah. And uh, let's say there's a five-minute clip. It's a nice fantasy to indulge in, but go ahead. What's that? It's a nice fantasy to indulge in, someone actually telling the truth in government. But uh, (laughs) go ahead. Of course, it would never happen. But let's say there's a five-minute segment. There's a whole talking head thing. And anyway, and then after that, the mainstream media says, oh, wait, we screwed up. We weren't supposed to air that. And, of course, there's there's just a blackout, like always. My point is I could take that video. Mm -hmm. I could show it to ten people. They're all going to say I'm nuts. Mm-hmm. They're still not going to wake up. Even if they believe the video, they'll sit there and ponder it in their head for a moment, and then they'll just go back to what they're doing, voting for Democrats or Republicans. The point is I've woken some people up, just like some people have woken me up, but most of the people that I deal with, including my family, they're so stubborn that they just don't understand. They think that, well, on one side, that they, they, they believe in the whole Democrat thing, and they watch CNN. The other side, they watch the whole Fox thing, and they believe in the Republican uh, philosophy, and I keep trying to tell them. I said they're all crooks. You know, nine eleven's an inside job. I, I go through the whole spiel, the mm-hmm. whole deal, and it doesn't matter. My point is, let's just say George Bush did Wiley Coyote style pull, push the plunger for for the uh, Trade Center. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter. Uh, take the ninety three bombing. It's all on record. 
that it was an oh yeah i mean that's what you're arguing is not so much hypothetical it's happened before and and referencing 1993 the first attack of the world trade centers they admitted it was their bomb they cooked and they told them to do it it was in the new york times 60 minutes and of course nothing occurs Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us on this live Friday edition as we broadcast worldwide. I am coming to you from a South Texas highway as I drive down the road via the magic of audio Skype. And Holland van der Neuenhoff, a filmmaker and researcher and talk show host in his own right, who I've known for many years, is uh, kind of the master of ceremonies, the MC today, uh, who is basically the traffic cop. Uh, we're going to have uh, also uh, David Knight at the bottom of the hour pop in with a bunch of other breaking news, including new developments in the West fertilizer explosion, uh, where they're uh, now saying it might be foul play. Uh, we're going to be uh, looking into that as well. And obviously, uh, Benghazi, then Jakari Jackson will pop in with some special reports uh, coming up in the last 30 minutes. And we're going to continue in the next two hours with open phones. I will be live, of course, in studio this Sunday, 4 to 6 p.m. Central Standard Time. But the reason I like to have Holland van der Neuenhoff in uh, is that I listen to his show uh, whenever I get a chance. And, of course, he's comfortable on his own show. And he's, he's a first-class uh, brain and does a great job. You can hear he's a little bit nervous uh, doing this one, going from hundreds of thousands to millions of listeners. Uh, but he's doing a great job today, so I want to welcome him uh, into the second hour. I know some stations and XM, now Channel 244, uh, join us in the second and third hours. And, of course, we also have InfoWars Nightly News. But I just wanted to you know, tell you why I have Holland Van den Neuenhoff hosting the show. You know, he was a uh, Marine Corps, uh, you know, rifle leader, and he's just a great researcher. And I've you know, heard his analysis, read his analysis, uh, and it's been spot on on so many points. Plus, with the case of Oklahoma City, he got the film made that is the only professionally done definitive work 18, 19 years uh, after that tragic event in 1995, open and shut who the players were, the bombs inside the buildings, who planted them directly from the police officers and other survivors. So uh, I always promote that film. I'm also in it. A Noble Lie, 1995, available on in InfoWarsStore.com. And uh, get it, show it to friends and family because they will then understand false flag. You, you see something like Benghazi or you see something like, uh, you know, something out there like, the Boston bombing, when you study covert history, military history, black op history, staged event history, and there's hundreds of declassified French, Italian, British, German, Nazi, Russian, communist, Tsarist before them, Maoist staged events. When you learn the Romans were obsessed with staging events and blaming it on their enemies, when you learn that, that this is such a part of history, then you look at each new event and say, well, is it the usual culprit or is it a real event? And there are real events. There are real events, kind of like there are four-leaf clovers, but they're very, very rare in a, in a grove of clover, in a patch of clover. You can look for 10 hours and maybe find one mutation that is the real lone wolf anomaly. Uh, very, very rare. Uh, maybe. Uh, the, you know, shootings in Norway. Maybe that was real. But there was a drill there and a stand down as well. They use the drill so if their operatives get caught, they can then say it was just part of the drill. <clears throat> they use it to also confuse everybody when the event happens so no one knows who was involved because there were so many people there taking part in something that mirrors it. But in the case of Benghazi, for those that don't know, when I've covered Bilderberg in the U.S., uh, last year and four years before that, almost five years ago in Virginia, they had Marines in plain clothes following us, uh, breaking in our room. We had some stuff taken. We, we believe it was them. I never made a big deal about that on air. Cracking into our phones and threatening us and telling us what we were talking about on the phone so they know it was the government. Flipping us off. We have photos of this in plain clothes. Marines coming in and sitting down next to us in the restaurant at our hotel saying, hey, you want to attack the State Department? And, and then they later just admitted who they were and said, we're making sure you're not playing anything. Okay, so the Marines guard the embassies. And Holland, of course, is a Marine, and he's talked to Marines, but it's on record the procedure. They had a base a mile away, less than a mile. They had helicopter bases five miles away. They had predators in the sky. 
the, the Al Qaeda forces were hired to be the head of security in Benghazi. There was a stand down, not a six hour, more like an eight hour from when they began to desperately call for help and the group was massing out front. And and Holland, we talked privately about what you believe happened. And, and, I, and, and I wish you'd break down some of that because a lot of my other sources agree they were meant to attack the place, use the protest as the cover to get the missiles in the warehouse behind it so the government could have plausible deniability later and say Al Qaeda stole the heat seekers, which they're now showing on you know, London Guardian and Associated Press. They're very proud of it. But regardless, when they lied, we now have a congresswoman up on Infowars.com saying, we ought to play that clip later if we have time. Uh, when David Knight comes in, you know, saying, no, Obama knew. Obama ordered the stand down. Of course he did. Of course Hillary was in charge of the State Department. They, once it started, they wanted those people dead. And the two SEALs assigned to CIA who broke orders to stand down, who went and shot at the guys from behind and made it go a lot longer, they are what made it incredibly obvious to CENTCOM and NATO and all of them that there was a stand down because NATO was in charge. See, that's why the globalists of Obama has transferred power to NATO, because now he can plausibly deny and cut the Pentagon chain out of things. This is a coup. We've had the coup. And now the coup is obvious that globalists have taken over America. This is what we're getting at. So I want you to be able to break that down, Holland, mm -hmm. and, and also continue to take some more calls. But th for those that study this, it came out day one that they stood down. It came out day one they had predators over it and got caught lying. Five days after it happened, they had Rice, ambassador of the UN, say that this wasn't terror, no one thought it. If, 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 if terror isn't hundreds of guys, first 200, then 300, then some estimates 400 or more, with anti-aircraft weapons at point blank range and grenade launchers and bazookas and heavy machine guns and a stand down with inside knowledge of how to break in and how to get past uh, the countermeasures. This is ridiculous. And again, it's hiding in plain view. And what's happened is they're using 1960s and 70s events when they controlled the newspapers and they controlled all the media to still run these events. And it doesn't work anymore. So, Holland, I wanted you before we got a break to spend the next five minutes. We know they're lying about Benghazi, but what do you think exactly happened there and how big will this be? And here's the big one. What will they stage? I said in the first hour yesterday, they might stage an attack on Obama to make him the victim. Horrible idea to call for violence. Horrible idea to wish for harm on Obama, as we've heard some say. That only turns him into a, uh, a victim. He is a puppet himself. Uh, you know, it's I would take the bullet for Obama, Alex. I would take it rather than listen to the martyrdom afterwards. Absolutely. So, so, so what will they do? A new war? Escalation of Syria? Another false flag? What do you think they're going to try to pull? That's the big one, because this is one of the biggest political events in the last hundred years in this country. This is a giant, huge event where they have been caught pants down, hand in cookie jar. This is huge. Holland. Again, again, they've been caught. And the false flag attack has become like I said, standard operating procedure. It's literally how they start a new program now. It's like, well, we're, we want to implement a new agenda. What do we do? Well, we're going to have to create something. We're going to have to create reality. Karl Rove talked about this openly during the Bush administration. They are now putting it on the ground. And what we're going to see in the future, Alex, I think obviously is an attack that's going to be blamed on domestic dissent. They still need to play that card and they perhaps they were trying to play it during the Boston bombings. And it would be hard for me to impart the frustration, the feelings I was going through watching that go down nearly on the anniversary of the Oklahoma City bombing during on Patriots Day when these significant dates in effect and we see terrorism again striking America. Uh, like Alex said, I served the United States Marine Corps. I was a rifle squad leader. And I took my oath seriously to the Constitution to defend it against all enemies, foreign and domestic. I nearly yelled those words in the rec recruiting station when I gave the oath because I meant it. And I told my Marines also that if I ever get the order to disarm the American people, the officer who gives that order, well, he's going to be a very unlucky man that day. And I'm headed home to defend my family. And they were good with that. They were very good with that. Uh, I actually like to make a revelation on air here on the Alex Jones Show. Uh, one of the arresting officers uh, of the Chechen bombers, the one they found in the boat, one of the arresting officers was actually uh, in my rifle squad in the Marine Corps. Um, we were very close. We got in a lot of scraps together. We, were, we are brothers. 
and um, he is unable to provide me with information. And when Anderson Cooper had the Watertown SWAT team on air in gear talking about their noble capture of the suspect, I noticed that my friend who was the officer who cuffed that man was not in that crowd. He was not being interviewed. In fact, he was uh, in the Caribbean on vacation. So they actually sequestered him. They sent him away, and he is unable to talk to anyone, especially me. Um, so the fix is in on that. They don't want people talking about the arresting officers talking about what they saw, the fact that in that boat that that kid had no weapon, that they riddled the boat with bullets trying to kill him. I was very surprised when they found that, found that boy alive. And, and, they, and then when he stood up, when he stood up, no blood out of the throat, then he cut his throat out. And now we have the video and the audio of them saying, don't shoot, we didn't do it. You have the witnesses saying they didn't shoot. They had orders to get rid of those guys, just mm -hmm. like the two dead cops, friendly fire, just like the cops shoot nine people in New York last year, trying to cover that up, saying it was a mass shooting. Mm -hmm. This happens over and over again. I mean, we would be crazy to believe what known liars are telling us over and over again. But, Holland, what you said, I know we're going to break. When we come back, what you said at the very start of the show, you should repeat that. That was an info war battle mm -hmm. over the truth at the beginning and middle and now throughout the next phase of the Boston bombing. Clearly, we've been lied to. Clearly, those guys were patsies. Clearly, the older brother was part of a CIA State Department funded uh, Muslim extremist infiltrator group. Because when they say groups out of Chechnya and Dagestan attacked America, those groups are all run by the globalists. They, support, they support the American government. I, I talked to a special forces operator who was shooting Russian cops in Chechnya in the mid 90s at the behest of this government. The Chechen groups support the U.S. government. They were created 100% exactly. on record funded. Because they were a tool against the Russians. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm the guest host today, Holland van de Neuenhoff. I'd like to reiterate a point I was talking about earlier, talking about winning the info war, winning the info battle. For those of you waiting for the revolution to occur, it's happening now. There's no reason to wait. The information revolution is now. We are in three phases of resistance. Right now, we're in the ideological phase, the information war of which Alex Jones and his operation are the tip of the spear, as we've seen in recent events. And what happened in Boston was a major historical battle in that information war. And we won hands down, won that battle. We're winning the war Hillary Clinton herself admitted on TV that we are losing the information war. That was a call for help. And they are hurting. They are That's losing. Right. And we are winning. Uh, what we saw in Boston, the fact that the official story was unraveling as it was being laid out, tells you that. So what's going to be the next learning paradigm for the information revolution? Perhaps unraveling these operations before they occur. Perhaps we can save lives. That is the challenge I'm issuing to this new information paradigm, to what we're doing now. We need to stop these attacks before they occur. We need to start saving lives directly. Show that to the world. Not only are we exposing this, we are saving lives. Are you still there, Alex? Yes, I am, and I'm gonna turn the broadcast over to you and the listeners and David Knight coming in with some breaking news uh, in the next segment. But again, it's a great responsibility. When I get up here on air and I tell the listeners, hey, uh, we're the tip of the spear. Uh, we're fighting the tyranny. We need your support. It's because it is it is creepy. It is it is scary uh, to to sit there and see the international media attack us and say, don't listen to us. And it's scary to know that we're effective. And it's scary to know that we're actually having victories against them. I mean, I mean it's booing. It's exciting. It's good because I want liberty. But it's also creepy uh, to, you know, to know that. That, that, that humanity does have power and that we have individually taken action against these people and that because we built a platform to do it, that we're having a huge effect. So that's why we ask listeners for their prayers, their support. And uh, Garrison was asked, Jim Garrison, you know, people said, well, how, do you, how are you still alive with all the JFK info? They've now had a top Republican come out and point out what we already know, that LBJ basically gave the order to have him killed with people above him. And he said, well, you know, you've got to stay in the sunshine. You've got to stay in the light. You've got to stay big. Our only answer going through this black hole is to go in through and beyond. We've got to go 110% because it's the old sports adage. 
As soon as you don't go 100%, that's when you get hurt. Anybody that plays sports knows that. Mm -hmm. It's not the football play where you go over 100% as hard as you can uh, that you get hurt. It's when you aren't when you paying attention, you don't go 100%. It's when you're lazy. None of us can be lazy. And the globalists are cornered right now. Uh, everything they do basically turns to crap. And but still they're in control. And, and Hillary two years ago said we're losing the info war emergency. Uh, Brzezinski's saying that. And so they're trying to set up a police state. But we need the people in government who aren't evil to realize this isn't a joke. And your naivete is going to empower this total takeover. And, and the general public, not just government. We get the government we deserve. We have been passive. We have been pathetic. And we have let so much of this evil take over. But here's the final big issue. They are going to try to stage something to get themselves out of this. And we need to put pressure on the Republicans to go all the way. There needs to be impeachment. There needs to be indictment. They have been caught ordering the stand down. They have been caught lying to Congress. They have been caught lying, just like Fast and Furious. They cannot get away with this Benghazi thing. This is so cut and dry. And I, quite frankly, am surprised that it's come out this hardcore uh, and that uh, the State Department people weren't bigger scumbags and have all this courage. That gives me faith that there are still a lot of good people, but we've got to stand behind good people. You can look at the body language of, of, of Hicks and others. Those are good men and women. They're freaked out. They're putting their lives on the line. They know what really happened. It's more than a stand down. It was an op to kill those people and then cover it up. And, it, and I saw Obama in Austin yesterday, video on the news live. He looked doubly arrogant and smug. That's a cover. These are men just like us. They can be defeated. We can restore the republic. But we've got to have the will and to believe we can win. The globalists are not all powerful. And if God be with us, who can stand against us? So, again, spread the word about the broadcast. Support our local AMF affiliates. This is history, what's happening. And, and we're willing to do it, so support us. And we're going to support others that stand up for truth. Holland and the off. I'm going to hand things over to you. I'll be back Sunday live, 4 to 6. And David Knight's coming up with you and phone calls. All this and a lot more straight ahead. And great job to the crew. Authoritarian control freaks throughout history have sought to make populations dependent. The United Nations openly has talked about using food as a weapon against the third world and the industrialized first world. State Department Memorandum 200, developed by Henry Kissinger, called for destroying the food capacity, not just of the United States, but every country in the world, so they could use food scarcity as a political weapon of control. Just a decade ago, less than 10 million Americans were on food stamps. Four years ago, it was 25 million. It's now reached almost 50 million. Socialist health care is designed to destroy our health care system. The establishment wants you to be a bunch of cowardly, dumbed-down people who can't stand up for yourselves. That's why they're rushing to try to restrict citizens owning firearms. Because since the early 1990s, gun ownership has gone straight up, while violent crime has gone straight down by 49%. And globalist-controlled strongholds like Chicago and New York, where they've taken the citizens' guns, have the highest crime rates in the world. What am I getting at here? The system doesn't want you to be self-sufficient. That's why I promote the fact that you should go out, buy firearms, and go take lessons and learn how to use them. I want you to stand up for your birthright of liberty and freedom. During a serious meltdown, they're going to tell you, hey, you want food? Turn in your guns. And that's why we need to put the globalists in check. And then finally bring them to checkmate by being self-sufficient, by being prepared, by having a garden, by learning how to can your own foods, by having friends and family and community that will stand together. But at the heart of that is having quality, storable foods. And that's why I went out more than a decade ago and found the very best food company to be my sponsor, eFoods Direct. They're the company that I personally use for my emergency food storage preparation, whether it be for natural disasters or the tyranny that is intensifying. So give them a call, 800-409-5633. That's 800-409-5633 or efoodsdirect.com forward slash Alex to find the weekly and monthly specials. But uh, they're always running the specials where you can get the free six meals and the eFoods Direct audio CD 
put together by the experts in storable foods to answer all your questions, the eFoods planning guide, the eFoods brochure, the eFoods catalog, plus um, six free meals, creamy potato soup, tortilla soup, and cheesy chicken rice so you can sample the high-quality storable foods from eFoods Direct. They've got a bunch of other specials. The two-week food supply provides one adult with 81 servings of healthy, delicious, storable food for 14 days. The one-month food supply provides 192 servings for 28 days. And then there's the one-month family food pack. It will change the way you look at the food in your pantry. Every time you eat one of these meals, you are eating healthy, delicious food and saving a lot of money. The three-month food supply, 576 servings of storable food for 91 days. And the one-year food supply will provide you with 2,304 servings of healthy, delicious, storable food for one full year. Your meals are as delicious and nutritious tonight as they'll be in 25 years. Bottom line, there's a bunch of specials at eFoodsDirect.com forward slash Alex. You can also call them at the toll-free number on your screen, and they can send you a catalog with all the specials detailed and tell you about the weekly and monthly specials that they're always running eFoodsDirect.com forward slash Alex to find all the specials or call the toll-free number. And so in closing, when you buy from eFoodsDirect.com, you are supporting the radio broadcast, the nightly news, the magazine, the films, and everything we're doing. Because we're not like MSNBC or Media Matters that get government and corporate funding to bring down America and bring in tyranny. We are funded by our sponsors and you, the viewers and listeners, that support them. Again, that's eFoodsDirect.com com forward slash Alex or 800-409-5633. And when you're also visiting Infowars.com or PrisonPlanet.com, you can click on the banners to take you to the weekly and monthly specials. It's like the Hank Williams Jr. song, A Country Boy Can Survive, because you can't starve us out and you can't make us run because these boys were raised on shotguns. Well, there aren't really a lot of good old boys left anymore, are there? And those that are out there are demonized and are enemy number one by Homeland Security. And good old boys come in all shapes, colors, and sizes. They're people that aren't chumps who understand that they're going to take care of their family and that nobody else is. They're people that understand that if somebody else is taking care of them, that makes them a slave. And that the government doesn't want you dependent because they want to build a great future for you. They want to get you dependent so they can social engineer us. So the answer is get self-sufficient, become men again, and tell the New World Order to go straight to hell. Alex Jones signing off for InfoWars.com and eFoods Direct, our great sponsor. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm guest hosting today, May 10th, Holland van den Neuenhoff. Ivan Studio Special InfoWars reporter David Knight with some topics, some timely news. Before we go into that, we had a caller call in earlier uh, announcing the news that someone had been investigated or there was an opening criminal investigation into the West Texas fertilizer plant explosion. That appears to be true. We just have been handing information by the producers here in Alex's studio that an EMT or IMSA worker is indeed under investigation for perhaps uh, being responsible for the explosion there in Waco, Texas. Obviously, it's very strange when a fertilizer plant in Waco, Texas, it goes up in fire just a couple days before the anniversary of Waco. Uh, my hackles were on edge there. Mm -hmm. and apparently, this uh, paramedic uh, named Bryce Reed was arrested for possessing a destructive device, according to local reports. Reed had been a speaker at a memorial service for the victims of the explosion. It's not clear that the two new developments are related. Now, keep in mind, uh, this person may or may not be involved. We've seen in recent history, the FBI pinning uh, major crimes on people, Elvis impersonators, uh, apparently uh, were involved with the uh, the poison letters, the D.C. The, the, it seems like they're kind of replaying the mid-90s when they were uh, using Richard Jewell as the bogeyman for so many things. They're doing the same thing now. So this paramedic may or may not be involved, may or not be guilty, and it may, it may or may not be true. So it is developing, it is breaking, and we will definitely keep an eye on it. But David Knight? Right, yeah, there's a lot of suspicious stuff about that. And we've had a lot of people asking us to uh, do more reporting on that. We've tried to stay on the obvious false flag with the obvious agenda, which is uh, the Boston bombing. Uh, you know, 
personally, I felt that uh, if the government was involved in this in some way, if it wasn't, uh, it wasn't likely that it was an accident, you know, but, you know, if it was just a criminal case because there was a lo longstanding lawsuit between them and Monsanto, mm -hmm. that had mm -hmm. been kind of dormant for a while. So it wasn't really clear what motivations anybody had, either personal or government motivations in this, if anything, because like you said, the timing and the location uh, looked like it might be a distraction. We wanted to stay on point. We wanted to stay on the Boston bombing because it was so obviously a false flag. Yeah. And speaking of that, I got to tell you, this first time we've met, I really love your documentary, A Noble Lie. And we've mentioned that many, many times from day one with this Boston bombing. And the fact that there were certain elements that were present that made it obvious that there was something going on here that wasn't exactly what the, the government was telling us. The fact that we had eyewitnesses saying that it was a drill at the beginning and at the end, and even the police chief saying that they had an unusually large number of people there. They were paying special attention to the finish line and all that sort of thing, as well as the pictures that surfaced and that sort of thing. Um, but as I told people, your documentary, A Noble Light, it took a long time for that to come out. There were mm -hmm. elements at the very beginning that were clear. I remember back when it happened, and I remember uh, the New American carrying uh, mm -hmm. Brigadier General... Uh, you probably Benton K. Parton, yes, yes, the New American did excellent work. And he was a, he was a specialist on that. He said mm -hmm. the blast pattern just it doesn't make any sense. You don't get a blast that big, you don't get that kind of a pattern from that. So there's exactly. something else going on. So it was clear from that standpoint, but... That was back in the 90s. You know, we didn't mm -hmm. have alternative media then. Mm -hmm. We didn't have people that were staying on this stuff in real time. You know, the, the government media basically was just, oh, yeah, that's, that's the way it is. So, <clears throat> but the stuff that you turned up took a long time to come out, took a lot of investigation on your part. Mm -hmm. Same thing happened with Mike McNulty and, and Waco. You know, he did a series of documentaries on Waco over a 10-year period of time. And as time goes on, the truth eventually leaks out, even when you've got a controlled press like they did in the early 90s, mm -hmm. even when you've got the government actively suppressing people and active in case of that police officer, you know, perhaps Terrence, killing him. Terrence right? Icke, yes, that he so, was murdered for what he saw. The truth eventually gets out. What's changed is that because now we've got an active, visible alternative media, it's changing much more quickly. Okay. Yeah. And you've got situations, look at, look at Benghazi, for example. Okay. That, that took a few months ago. It was obvious even to the mainstream press was calling BS on the fact that this was the Muslim street inflamed by some movie, you know. In one location across the Middle East. Only one place where they met and they, they killed the ambassador. Exactly. That, that was just beyond belief for anybody. And yet Hillary Clinton and Susan Rice stuck with that story. It's like, that's my story and I'm sticking to it, you know, and they did it's that the, for It was the, the only thing they had. The exactly. only thing they had. Exactly. So... When people say, <clears throat> when people look at our research, and we, we have to document stuff more carefully than the mainstream media does because they rely on your, your cred, credulous faith. Well, that's the thing, Dave, and that's the thing about, there was a call earlier trying to explain this frustration about trying to wake people up. And the position we are in trying to uh, fight the official narrative is that every single one of our facts must be true to the T, mm -hmm. ultimately vetted. Because the thing is, when you're trying to wake someone up and you're presenting them with information, if you have one fact that it's not backed up, they will latch on to that and hold on to that regardless of the rest of the bulk of your argument. That's right. It's, it's all lost because one thing that you said perhaps did not uh, uh, pan out to a T. Mm -hmm. and, they, and that is just human nature. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, whatever. It's human nature, and if you're going to want to wake people up, you're going to have to deal with that. And the counter to that is to being absolutely sure and vetted in, in your information. But the thing is, that's not too hard either because mm -hmm. what the stories they put out are simply ludicrous. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So these types of things are going to come out. And when people call us conspiracists, I mean, pick a conspiracy, Fast and Furious, Benghazi, uh, you know, even going back in time, look at the Iran-Contra thing, right? Yeah. You know, I mean, it's just, yes, government does get involved in conspiracy. And yes, it is selected elements within the government. Hey, that's modus operandi. Conspiracy is two or more people engaging in a criminal enterprise. Right. I mean, that's the bulk of criminal activity. Right. And the government charges people with a crime of conspiracy all the time. But they, they level that charge at us, essentially, to say, you're off in loony land. But like you said, we have to carefully document everything. And it was amazing to me that this hit piece that came from National Review against Alex Jones was basically mm -hmm. talking about the gospel of Alex Jones and how he's got some credulous audience that just takes everything that he says on faith. When in reality, they didn't back that up with anything. They even the first paragraph they went into was talking about bullets and ammunition story, which from day one, we linked to the FedBiz op page, yeah. which showed the actual 
purchase order. And now it turns out, you know, Senator Inhofe is now confirming that's all true. That's right. not conspiracy theory. And, and the National, and National Review made the, the incredible statement that the ammunition levels were the same as they were the previous year, and it was all for target hunting. And we had deceived these congressmen and senators who were coming in there. So they threw <laughs> their own See, National Re under the bus. Yeah, yeah, National Review is supposed to be an arch conservative, has been an arch conservative paper for decades or, or, or news magazine. How come they are... Uh, Serving, how come they are fulfilling a propaganda agenda for the government? Well, because th from their beginning, they were affiliated with the CIA, William yep. F. Buckley, and, and the neocons, and they have basically been cheerleaders for every military engagement everywhere. So just like MSNBC, you know... If and you, CNN. If you, yeah, yeah, if you scratch their roots, you find the CIA, and you find the military-industrial complex, you know, rapidly. Is that so hard to believe, people, that the media is controlled? Just think about it this way. Power organizes, right? Power organizes to to um, implement its own agenda, fulfill its own needs. Why would the power elite not control the media? Right. Of, that's of course they would. That's two and two equals four. They would control the media. The fact that they, well, if you think that they don't control the media, that's anomalous to to the laws of history and nature. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, changing the subject off of Benghazi, off of the conspiracy stuff again. Uh, we mentioned this briefly, and I, I want to cover this. This D.C. march that's coming up. Yeah, Adam Kokesh, yeah, former Marine, is calling for an armed march on July 4th to, uh, uh, I guess, to symbolize our, our stand on gun rights, mm -hmm. marching armed around D.C. It's, it's ballsy. And a lot of people have called into question. And, of course, there's a lot of risk, as people pointed out. There's a lot of risk that the government can false flag that. Uh, that you can put agent provocateurs. A provocateur, in fire one a shot. Lot of people, exactly. They have now have an excuse to basically do whatever they want if one guy it's does something very, foolish. very risky. Yeah. However, there is a reason for him going in with loaded rifles. And we've got a special report that I did basically looking at and analyzing what the D.C. police chief said and what the Supreme Court has done relative to the D.C. laws five years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, let's play that special report right now, guys. Okay, they got it coming up in just a second. Well, Washington Police Chief Kathy Lanier had this to say when asked about Adam Kokesh's planned 4th of July march into Washington with loaded rifles. First of all, I want to clear up, uh, there's a difference between civil disobedience, which I think is this is being portrayed as a civil disobedience, and actually violation of the law. I mean, there's two different things here. So civil disobedience, people come to Washington, D.C. to, to protest um, policies and government policy uh, all the time. It's no problem. But when you cross into the District of Columbia with firearms and you're not in compliance with the law, now you're talking about a criminal offense and there's, you know, there's going to be some action by police. So Chief Lanier wants to make some kind of a distinction between civil disobedience and violating the law. So here again is her definition of civil disobedience. Civil disobedience, people come to Washington, D.C. to, to protest um, policies and government policy uh, all the time. It's no problem. Note that Chief Lanier characterizes peaceful assembly in order to petition the government as civil disobedience. But what law does a demonstration break? When someone exercises their right to protest, specifically recognized by the First Amendment, how is that disobedience in any way? Since the D.C. police chief hasn't read the Constitution that she swore to uphold when she took office, let's remind her what it says. The right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. Chief Lanier. Going to Washington and protesting government policy is not civil disobedience. It's an exercise of a constitutionally guaranteed right. Civil doesn't mean polite. It means government. And as we all know from experience, government is not always civil. Disobedience means to actively and publicly disobey laws that are unjust. It is violating the law. Martin Luther King had this to say about violating a court order against him marching. Uh, that I do feel that there are two types of laws. One is a just law and one is an unjust law. I think we all have moral obligations to obey just laws. On the other hand, I think we have moral obligations to disobey unjust laws because non-cooperation with evil is as much a moral obligation as is cooperation with good. Civil disobedience always involves violating a law. That's where the disobedience part comes in. So Kathy Lanier's distinction between civil disobedience and violating the law is nonsense. But what is the law that Adam Kokesh 
and his marchers would be disobeying or violating. The very law that was struck down by the Supreme Court in 2008 in D.C. versus Heller. Now it's interesting to note that Dick Heller, the plaintiff in the case, was actually a D.C. cop who was suing for his right to carry a gun off duty. Of course, the real precedent for it being an individual right is the Second Amendment itself. Both the Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court of the United States ruled that D.C.'s gun laws violate the Constitution. Washington, D.C.'s Firearms Control Regulation Act of 1975 specifically outlawed handguns and requires all firearms, including rifles and shotguns, to be kept, quote, unloaded and disassembled or bound by a trigger lock. That is why I imagine Adam Kokash and the D.C. marchers are going to be marching with loaded rifles to illustrate the fact that Police Chief Lanier and the District of Columbia have thumbed their noses at the Constitution and the Supreme Court decision of five years ago. So Police Chief Lanier, there is no difference between civil disobedience and violating the law. But since you maintain there's a distinction, I would ask you, is your refusal to obey a Supreme Court ruling of five years ago that was made specifically about your gun laws and your refusal to obey the Constitution that you swore to uphold? Is that civil disobedience or is that violating the law? For InfoWars, I'm David Knight. That was excellent work, David. I thought it was very interesting that the D.C. police chief basically said that you're free to do as you're told. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. Right. I mean, that, those, those were the words out of her mouth. I mean, she, yeah. she had no concept of what civil disobedience means. Disobedience, like you said, means disobeying an unjust law. By definition, breaking law, she viewed civil disobedience only, only as lawfully approved activity. Right, right. Exactly. I mean, it's almost as if, you know, if you're going to come here and have a protest... I don't really want you to do that, but I'm going to tolerate it. So that's, you know. And that makes me such a wonderful person because I'm tolerating you speaking your mind. Exactly. I mean, no, you, if you go all the way back to Thoreau, uh, the whole idea is, is that if you've got an unjust law, uh, in his case, he was protesting slavery and the Mexican-American War. Mm -hmm. And he was saying, you know, if you allow these injustices to go on, you are consenting to those. And so what he's saying is when the government is, and then that was applied to specific laws in the case of Gandhi and Martin Luther King. You, ha you have laws that are on the books that are uh, unlawful, unconstitutional, immoral. Well, I mean, the thing is, we have, have an obligation to fight that. And we have 40,000 laws on the books. The average person commits three felonies a day. So which laws exactly are we supposed to be, are you supposed to be enforcing, or which are we supposed to be following? Exactly. Because if you really believe that you must follow the law, no matter what it says, you're going to have a long day in front of you. Well, and one of the things that I found interesting about her is that the liberals like to say, don't take the text as a liberal, as a literal meaning. Mm -hmm. right? So the liberals don't want to be literal. Mm -hmm. Okay, they want a living constitution, which basically says, if the Supreme Court says it means this, it now means mm -hmm. this, regardless. Mm -hmm. There are no principles, obvious. it just evolves to what we want it to be. Right, right. So you've got a law that we can all read and we can all understand it because it's clear. But if the Supreme Court says that it means exactly the opposite, then that's what we're going to go with, the living constitution. So, and it'll be unclear because it'll be written by lawyers and Supreme Court justices. It will not be clear to read. Exactly. But in this particular case, the Supreme Court, which is her you know, typical liberals appeal, ultimate appeal to authority, mm -hmm. the Supreme Court struck down her law five years ago. Mm -hmm. And they're not, uh, you know, they're not, they're still enforcing that. Yeah. And I tried to uh, contact them. I, I uh, sent them two emails. I left a phone message. I talked to someone independently. I could not get her to talk to me about it. So that's why I did the piece here. I would much rather have interviewed her and talked to her about it. But, you know, well, she's I mean, not going to defend that. <laughs> of course not. And you can see what she is. She was basically a bureaucrat in a uniform. Right. And, and what a uniform. Wasn't that a great uniform? Yeah, yeah. All those uh, stars. <laughs> yeah, I was, you look like uh, Ike Eisenhower there getting ready to land on the beaches of Normandy. Actually, I was I, impressed. I, I thought she looked more like uh, somebody out of a Gilbert and Sullivan or Marx Brothers movie. There, <laughs> but, uh, it was, I was thinking was like space uniform. balls, actually. <laughs> that's right. But, you, but that's what you have is you have a bureaucrat in uniform without a sense of irony, mm -hmm. telling us that civil disobedience is following the law. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess, well, she probably did go to public school is what it is. And, and look at the way they control demonstrations, though, too. I mean, you know, you've got controlled free speech zones when they have political yeah. conventions and everything. They put people, literally put the demonstrators in cages mm -hmm. and give them one microphone and a soapbox. I mean, it's absolutely absurd what they do at political conventions. It's absolutely absurd what they do at G8 conventions and everything. You know, Rob Dew was arrested a couple of years mm -hmm. ago, and, and he wasn't even, they were miles away from the event. 
And uh, they sent out an army of like 1,500 cops to uh, bully and bludgeon and arrest a, a crowd of uh, demonstrators, ironically, against police brutality. Oh. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, you talk about not having a sense of irony. You know, yeah. They don't have a sense of irony or a sense of humor or even a sense of what's legal and illegal. Exactly. They just have a sense of what authority is telling them what to do. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I am guest hosting today. My name is Holland Van Den Noonhoff. I have David Knight in studio discussing his uh, reporting, some special insight on topics going on. David, what would you like to uh, cover next? Well, we were talking about uh, Cody Wilson coming mm -hmm. in here and talking about uh, the 3D gun issue and that sort of thing. And, and uh, we had a report from Jakari Jackson. Uh, we don't really have enough time to play that because we've got a short... Uh, segment here, but you can see that on Prison Planet TV. You can also see it uh, probably on Infowars.com, but certainly on the Alex Jones channel on YouTube. It's only about three minutes, but it's a good interview. But it's important on a number of issues, just like you mentioned, you know, they're asserting this UN arms trade treaty, mm -hmm. which hasn't even been ratified uh, by the Senate. Okay. Well, they're asserting it now, but a year ago, that was a conspiracy theory. That's right. The UN treaty. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And actually, now they're invoking it. I believe it was a conspiracy. I believe that Fast and Furious was a part of building up a false flag. I mean, the New York Times has mentioned that Fa Fast and Furious was a false flag. I believe that they were trying to build up a narrative saying, uh, this is why we need to have the UN Arms Trade Treaty. Yeah, they, they were building up that narrative. I remember uh, several years ago when um, border violence was making news, and I saw President Obama get on the news and say that the border violence was a result of, of course, guns being uh, you know, bought in American gun stores. And I was thinking... He just okay. repeated that again this last week yeah. down in Mexico. Really? Yeah, yeah the same charge. Uh, yeah. Well, he certainly uh, has no shame. No. Because President Obama is responsible for the death of at least 3,000 Mexican citizens. I'm surprised that people in Mexico are not enraged that he is in their country talking to them about gun violence. Absolutely. Yeah, you're talking about that directly with Fast and Furious. Mm -hmm. Indirectly, you could say the entire Mexican drug war yeah. is American foreign policy. Mm -hmm. okay? Because when you look at the gun violence in American cities, for example, the Chicago police chief has said that 80% of the firearms fatalities in Chicago are drug gang related. It's mm -hmm. all about, it's just, you know, what, same thing we had with Al Capone yeah. driving by and shooting rival gangs with machine guns. Exact hanging on same those. thing. Exactly. Prohibition always does that. You know, quite frankly, if they prohibit guns, <laughs> You're going to see that in spades. Because well, I mean, if, if, I mean, we're not talking hypotheticals here. Look at Chicago. They actually have banned firearms. You can't own a firearm in Chicago literally to save your life. In one day, 20 people get shot. Absolutely. 20 people don't get shot in one day in Afghanistan, okay? But it happens on the streets of Chicago where guns are illegal. Mm -hmm. So why do you think, how do people think or politicians think that outlawing guns on a mass scale is going to solve any problem Besides uh, criminalizing guns and making every gun, gun, gun crime will shoot through the roof because it, literally guns will be illegal. Absolutely. Going back to this UN Arms Trade Treaty, I believe that the goal all along for this round at mm -hmm. least, ultimately they're after uh, total prohibition, but their goal this time around is registration. Yep. Universal they background checks registration. They need to have that before they can really do a good job of confiscation. And I believe that the UN Arms Trade Treaty, as well as Fast and Furious, all this was targeted toward that. And we can see now, in the case of Cody Wilson, that they're even asserting these same sorts of things to shut down, uh, you know, the 3D gun mm -hmm. uh, stuff. But if you look at the timing as well, the UN Arms Trade Treaty was coming up in July for a vote. And the week before, it, and it was in trouble because all this Fast and Furious yeah. stuff was, was breaking. So it broke but it went the opposite way that they wanted to. Everybody found out it was a false flag. Just like Climate Gate. Exactly. They tried to pull off a contrived uh, agenda, and it blows up literally in their face. Mm -hmm. So that had broken, and it was interesting that exactly a week to the day before they were to have the U.N. Arms Trade Treaty, they did the Aurora, Col uh, Colorado shooting happened. Wow. And so, you know, I thought that was basically going to push it over the edge. That didn't get them any traction. So what they did was they delayed it to after the American election. Mm -hmm. And uh, it looked like they were going to set it up to do it as a, a lame duck session, but they did it after uh, afterwards because they had big wins in the Democrats and Obama. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. There's a methodology to the madness, people. You're listening to it now on The Alex Jones Show. I'm guest hosting today, Holland Van de Neuenhoff, and we will be right back. Welcome back to The Alex Jones Show, May 10th, 2013. I'm the guest host today, Holland Van de Nornhoff. We had David Knight on with a special report on the planned 
uh, armed march in D.C. on July 4th by Adam Kokesh and others. Adam Kokesh obviously is a former Marine like myself, like myself, so uh, I am following this very closely. I respect the man very much and his courage in uh, taking an armed march on D.C. not to break the law or to commit violence, but to demonstrate our belief in our ability to carry our firearms wherever we like, to assert our rights whenever we like, and not ask for government permission. Because if you have to ask for permission too many times, eventually you're just going to be banned. And that's what's happening. And David Knight was right. Registration, background checks, those are a preliminary to outright confiscation. And we're not arguing hypotheticals here. That has happened in every nation that has outlawed outright firearms. It has been always preceded by registration or background checks and licensing. Now, you may say, well, that sounds great. Oh, we should license firearms because they're dangerous. Well, they license cars also, and that does not make driving any safer, and no one is talking about banning cars. And also, cars are not in the Bill of Rights of the Constitution. Firearms are for a reason, for the very reason this government, not just this government, and the United Nations is so intent on stripping us of our right to firearms. Why are they, they so intent on disarming us? If they're not after our guns, why are they doing it and why? What is in the future that we're going to take such offense to where they're going to be afraid of an armed populace? If you cannot trust your people with firearms, then the government cannot be trusted. And the fact that they're exerting such effort, years in the making, fast and furious, like David Knight said, was specifically planned to culminate in a, within a certain time period, which failed. The story blew up. Once again, the information war winning out over the lie. The story blew out just like ClimateGate, right before their big conference. It came out the emails that they had faked all of the evidence. It has been further uh, corroborated since then. There's actually been a global cooling period. I really don't want to hear the, the phrase uh, global warming again for the rest of my life now. It's, it's done. It's gone. It's dead. Or global climate change. That's a state of being. Anyways, same thing with gun control, with Fast and Furious. That was planned far in advance. Utilizing ATF, FBI, monitoring gang members, or encouraging them to purchase firearms in American gun stores. When those gun stores, when the owners um, exhibited reluctance to sell firearms to known gang members and called the ATF saying, hey man, I don't want to sell to this guy. I got a bad feeling, his paperwork is not up to speed, he has a criminal history, and I don't want to sell a gun to this criminal. You know what the ATF told him? You will sell him that gun, or we will come to your store and find any violation. You didn't cross an I, you didn't dot a T, we're going to take you down, unless you play ball. So, of course, they played ball, they sold the guns, those guns were moved down to Mexico over a number of years, thousands of them. Those guns have been recovered from thousands of crime scenes, where innocent people, victims of the war on drugs in Mexico have been slain. And they were slain by weapons provided by the United States government that they moved across the border into a foreign country. And like I said, the people of Mexico need to wake up to what's really going on. Some of them are, they're talking about it. But the fact that they tolerated President Obama to come over there and lecture them about gun violence when President Obama is personally directly responsible for over 3,000 deaths and serves a system that's indirectly responsible for thousands more because of the war on drugs. He needed to be talked to about what his government had been doing in Mexico, not trying to tell Mexico how to stop gun violence in this country. Hi, Ted Anderson, president of Midas Resources. With over 30 years of experience in the precious metals business, I can tell you without a doubt, we are facing the most dangerous and volatile times, not just in the United States, but worldwide. Peace of mind is gold and silver. Now is the time to invest in gold. When it comes to bullion coins, our prices are competitive and the closest to melt. If it's numismatics you're looking for, we have some of the best deals out there. Visit MidasResources.com today or go to Infowars.com and click on the link 
link to see our daily specials. Here is an example of one of our long-term specials we've been offering for more than a year. Two silver dollars from the turn of the last century, plus two powerful films, The Obama Deception and The American Dream. We also add in the book Dishonest Money, all for $72 and free shipping. The most trusted name in precious metals is Midas Resources. Call 1-800-686-2237 or go to Infowars.com. I'm Ted Anderson with Midas Resources. We are now only entering the edge of a global financial superstorm, the likes of which the planet has never seen. Here in the United States, the private Federal Reserve is giving more than $85 billion of taxpayer money a month to themselves and other offshore foreign banks. And the worst part is, we have to pay the bank's interest on the money we give them. There is now a race between the global central bank mafia cartels to see who can devalue their country's currencies the fastest. We are already seeing big increases in inflation at the grocery store and the gas line. This will eventually lead to hyperinflation. More than a dozen top globalists like George Soros have been buying record amounts of gold while at the same time bad-mouthing it to the public. Don't just listen to what they say. Watch what they do. For more than 6,000 years of recorded human history, gold has been the ultimate head against uncertain times and inflation. Before investing in metals, it is important to do your own research and find a reputable company. Midas Resources has the highest Better Business Bureau rating of an A+. Unfortunately, very few precious metal companies can boast that. Midas Resources has assembled one of the most educated, researched, and professional teams of brokers in the industry. The evidence is overwhelming. In uncertain times, gold and silver is safe harbor. Now is the time to invest in gold. Call 800-686-2237 and Midas Resources will make you 10 reasons to own gold absolutely free. No shipping. It's absolutely free. And finally, Ted Anderson wants to challenge you to find any deal that comes close to his two silver dollars at cost with free shipping with two free films and a book for $72. That's more than $160 value for $72 shipping included. Click the link at InfoWars.com to go to the MidasResources.com specials page. Brought to you by MidasResources.com and Ted Anderson. The trusted name in precious metals. Welcome back to the last hour of the Alex Jones Show. I'm guest hosting today, May 10th, 2013. My name is Holland Van de Noenhoff. I've been on the show a number of times. I guest hosted uh, for the first time several months ago. I had a wonderful time, and I thank Alex for inviting me back. Apparently, he wanted to take the day off. He does have a long, hard schedule, so I'm uh, more than happy to give him some relief and to have the honor to be on one of the most popular radio and news shows in the world, especially in the light of what happened after the Boston bombing, when people are becoming aware, when Google searches for the term false flag attack increase a hundredfold, you know that this audience is increasing and people are waking up. Of course, I've been asked on to host because of the special insight I've learned and gained as a researcher, writer, producer for the documentary, A Noble Lie, Oklahoma City, 1995, which is about the Oklahoma City bombing in 1995, the first modern expose of that event. I highly recommend that product, if only, not only because I worked on it, but if only because I've been told more than once, and this is the greatest honor I could have gotten out of that movie, was that that film has provided, has been a wake-up tool to so many people by the very fact when they look at Oklahoma City and they realize the weight of evidence that is contrary to the official story, but yet the government and the media is still invested in the official story, people realize the depth of the lie that they will engage in to cement their control. Knowing that to be true, people can apply that to current events and view those, lens, those, those events through that lens and perhaps not abide by whatever horrific agenda is always on the table when these deep state events occur. This is the uh, last hour of the Alex Jones Show. We're going to have Jakari Jackson coming on in just a few short minutes giving a special report. We have a number of callers on the line. I want to get to them because they've been patient. It looks like we have Witness in Texas. Hello, Witness, if that's your name. You're on the Alex Jones Show. What would you like to talk about? Thank you, sir. I'm here to share the facts about the ongoing war by many here to define my right to speak truth to power. In fact, Alex Jones himself asked me by name 
to call in about this very subject last time I was on air here. And back then, Austin's mayor had banned me from City Hall for trivial, nonsensical hogwash reasons. And since then, I've been banned from the Travis County Commissioner's Court twice already. And recently... Well, it certainly sounds like you're trying hard enough. I congratulate you. Well, thank you, sir. And uh, I've been trying to get through to talk about this ever since. And, And the most recent one was... Uh, the presiding Judge Bisco of the Travis County Commission Court, he banned me from for four months, meaning 16 weeks. I'm an involved citizen. I go every week, and this is for five mm-hmm. years now. I have a better attendance record than even the judge. Well, you know, if, if every citizen out there is a thing, there was a lesson from the uh, Gulag Archi- Archipelago where a prisoner decided to fight back against the system by basically filling out every single piece of paperwork there was. It was all legal. He was simply playing the system by its own rules, and if every every and it, and it basically brought that whole camp to a halt because every every prisoner around him was writing letters to certain bureaucrats, certain officials that had to be answered, had to go through a process. The whole system in that region ground to halt by weight of paperwork. Now, if we as citizens actually just get on the ground and get involved in every aspect of civil, meaning government life, that would bring the whole thing to a grind right now, which is why probably they find your uh, your obstinance so uh, unnerving. Hallelujah. That's exactly true, and um, friends are starting to come. Uh, uh, they, I was told by a couple of friends that they would actually uh, come to the Travis County Commissioner's Court and speak on my behalf. That didn't happen, So, but the, you know, scheduling conflicts came up. But uh, it's still, uh, they're going to help me. There, there are more people who are helping me on this. And, and again, my, my big crime was just, I was uh, uh, there to speak on an item on the agenda. Exactly. And I was sitting up there on stage. All they want is rubber stamps. They just want rubber stamps. They don't want qualified debate. They don't want the citizens asking questions. They want a rubber stamp on what they, what agenda they wish to implement. And if a citizen stands up, even in the halls of city council, and begins to exercise his civic duty in this day and age, that citizen can become a problem very quickly. That's exactly right. It was $25 million of, of taxpayer money that they were planning on uh, just giving away on, on yet another uh, boondoggle here, and it was my turn to speak. Mm-hmm. I was sitting up there for a half hour taking notes on all these government officials who were making excuses, and it was my turn to speak, and the judge said, Okay, Mr. Reefer C., do you have anything relevant to to say? I mean, I was sitting there for a half hour, Mm -hmm. and obviously I had three pages of notes. But when I questioned his questioning me, you know, he he defied decorum by not letting me speak. It was my time to speak. He interrupted me with an illogical question, and I threw it back at him. Well, by golly, Judge, isn't that a little bit, uh, you know, idiotic? And I didn't call him an idiot. I just said that oh, that's not wise to insult a judge in his own courtroom. Uh, is there another? Is there an upcoming event you're going to be uh, attending, speaking at? You need to raise support for. Yes, sir. I go every Tuesday, and that is the uh, every weekly meeting of the Travis County Commissioner's Court, and they start at nine. And uh, I need. We all need more people to show up. There and you go. I'll speak on my behalf, or just. Uh, defy the judge from, I mean, he doesn't have that role to defy me, my constitutional rights, because he didn't like the question I was going to ask. Well, you know what? If you give up and go home, he will win. So keep up your fight and keep on fighting because you know what? It's not just your liberty. It's everyone's liberty at stake. I have very good friends of mine who are fighting for the liberty of everyone in court, risking their own freedom. And I commend you all. Thank you for calling in witness. Bless you. Thank you, sir. Uh, We'll get to the next caller in a second. It's a very good point, fighting back on the local level. Because the political game on the national level, on the big level, that's fixed. We saw that with the Ron Paul campaign in both presidential elections. Where the will of the people was and how the establishment responded by literally stealing elections, stealing conventions, locking doors on people, behaving in childish manners to preserve their stranglehold on the way we educate our environment or so-called democracy. So knowing that, that the, the national game is fixed, how do we fight back? On the local level, everywhere. Because they can control the national level. What they cannot control is mass insurrection in every city council, in every county commissioner's meeting. They cannot control that, which is why they don't tell you the power you can exercise in those chambers. You really want to mess up the system, go local. Anyways, let's go to our next caller, Anne-Marie of Illinois, 
Hello, Anne Marie. Welcome to Alex Jones Show. What would you like to talk about? Well, I was hoping that Alex Jones was on today so I can tell him thank you. Well, I'll pass it along. Um, I'm sorry? I'll pass it along. He needed to take a day off. You understand? Yeah, I do. He's, you know, he's got so much on his mind. But anyway, I do live in Illinois, and I'm very, very aware of what's going on here. And I've always questioned certain things, but certain people always says, like you say on the radio, conspiracy theory. Mm -hmm. But I've always been that person, like, in the Matrix where you're half asleep and half awake. Mm -hmm. You know, I just came back from Illinois, Anne-Marie, on a project, and I've never been to that state. I am returning, not by choice, uh, but for the project. And I was amazed at the police state presence outside Chicago. That is Obama land. I mean, I have, I mean, I, I grew up in Oklahoma. I've lived in Texas and lived in a couple different places around the world. But I've never seen on a highway in America, or no, a street in America, within a quarter mile, three different police officers just standing there by the side of the road, pointing a radar gun at traffic. Nothing else to do. Outside the murder capital of the world, where, where 20 people get shot in a day, the police are literally just lazing every car that goes by. Every intersection, as far as I could tell, had a red light camera. Now, I don't know if that's the new standard in America. I live in the... Uh, in Oklahoma, like I said, and we're kind of behind the times, for better or worse. But I was shocked. Every intersection had a red light camera. And the people were not safer. They certainly were not happier. They, in fact, it's the most stratified stratified society I've ever seen. The people were at war with one another. And uh, I couldn't l- wait to like. leave. Yeah, That's how they want it, and that's how it is, because it's normal. We consider it normal. We never really ride down Lakeshore Drive and see that gun and think it wasn't normal. So that's the brainwashing. I hope it never becomes normal where I live, but if things keep on going, I'm sure they will. Well, I am a citizen that's awake. And like you state, they don't like us awake. They like us sleep. And I hate the fact of you know, governing people with control. I am not from this country. I wasn't born here, but I am a citizen of this country. And anything Alex Jones speak about, I do my research on because I don't take people at face value. I have to know what they're about and do your research. People wake up. Simple. Well, thank you for calling in, Anne-Marie. Sorry about that. I had a bug in my throat. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about? Um, just I hope that your listeners are listening, and I hope that more people like me start to wake up and realize that we are in control and we need to voice our opinion. And I hope that, especially for my community here in Illinois, realize that this is all a game. Well, people are waking up, Anne Marie, and even in Illinois, which is the heart of the beast in many ways, <clears throat> yeah. your efforts are even needed more directly, you are behind enemy lines, uh, and your efforts, uh, like a commando behind enemy lines, are felt even more effectively. And I thank you for calling in, and I thank you. Thank you, guys. Let's go to the next caller, Peter from Boston. This is regarding the Boston bombings. Let's get some eyes on the scene in Boston with Peter. Welcome to the Alex Jones Show. Thank you very much, Holland. And I've seen bits of your documentary, and, and I, it enlightened me in a way I was part of my waking up process, so thank you for that. I want to talk about the congressional hearings yesterday. At okay. The, uh, yeah. hey, hey, Peter, you know what? I want to talk to you about this, but we're coming up on break, and we'll get to you right on the other side. Is that all right? Yes, excellent. It's regarding the bombings. Excellent. We want to listen to what you have to say about that. You are from Boston. You're listening to The Alex Jones Show. I am guest hosting. My name is Holland Van de Neuenhoff. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. In a few minutes, we're going to have Jakari Jackson on with a special report. That'll be interesting, I'm sure. As of now, we're taking your calls. We have Peter from Boston, who's going to offer his insight on the Boston bombing. So, Peter from Boston, welcome to the Alex Jones Show again. Thank you for holding over the break. What would you like to discuss? Well, first I want to start by saying I agree with Alex's uh, Alex's scenario of the uh, suspects uh, being... Um, in, uh, CIA op- operatives under it's the, not a scenario, that's an analysis. Yeah, you're right. Go ahead. I do agree with Alex.
Alex, on that. But I want to talk about the hearings yesterday because I think this is where we'll see the agenda starting to play itself out. I want to make five quick points. This is what I took from watching the hearings. Uh, there seem to be three three agendas, uh, five agendas. The first one is that they want to eliminate the police jurisdictions that separate uh, radio communications between different town, small town departments and mm-hmm. other town departments. The well, do you, do you think they want to do that to restrict people listening in on those communications or? They want to uh, open up, they want to be able to override the small town uh, police radio transmission so that they could, for instance, call for a stand down. The Watertown mm-hmm. police were the first to arrive at the boat, and I think that they're responsible for saving that kid's life because if they hadn't been there, I don't know if he'd be alive today. Uh, like so I said, the um, thing they want to do go ahead. They want to criminalize not reporting if your neighbor, your friend, your spouse, or your parents don't uh, express anti-government sentiments. Well, they're already talking about it in Florida, where they're saying that if your neighbor hates the government, I want to know that man's name. Exactly, or you're liable for a a crime. Mm -hmm. The third point is that they want to monitor the Internet, uh, people's use of the Internet, to uh, to visit anti-government websites. Yeah, they're talking about the self-radicalization, once again blaming an inanimate object. Exactly. Uh, the internet on uh, as being responsible for this terrorist act. They want to be able to censor the internet, mm-hmm. and they want to be able to promote uh, the demonization of Islam. And I think more than anything, they want to promote the demonization of Islam. And I think that well, it fulfills um, the purpose. It it uh, justifies the continued war on terror. It uh, justifies the continued crackdown on our liberties. They're going to milk. The, the Muslim uh, excuse as far as they can, as long as it is effective. And I cannot not imagine the fear that um, good, honest Muslim Americans are feeling as a result of all of this uh, bashing yeah. of their, themselves and their religion. But, you know, I also believe that everything that they're accusing the Islamists of, they themselves are guilty of. And by yeah. they, I mean these infiltrators into every vector of influence in the United States government and uh, including the media and publications for the last hundred years. And I think you know which group I'm talking about. Well, yeah, they're trying to engineer a clash of civilizations. They've talked about this by demonizing the Muslim world. And it's working. Exactly. I have uh, with pe- all, again, accusing them of all the things that actually they themselves are guilty of, mm-hmm. and these infiltrators. And uh, they're, in, they're in every level, in every place, in every organization, in every charity, and they have essentially taken over every vector of influence that we're, we're, that we're exposed to as American Americans at home. I also want to, I just want to quote uh, James Forrestal, who was um, mysteriously found dead. Hanging uh, from a hospital sheet from his hospital was, room. Yes. Yeah, he was the first Secretary of Defense, and he said, no group in this country should be permitted to influence our policy to the point it could endanger our national security. Mm-hmm. And I believe there is a group that has infiltrated, again, every vector of influence, and, and, uh, and I think that group needs to be identified, and not to identify it is to do nothing but slash at the branches and not the root of the problem. That's my opinion. That's my, that's what I've... That's, well, that's where I'm coming from. With Peter, it. I appreciate your eyes on the ground in Boston, your insight, the fact that you're awake, and for calling in. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Excellent. Yes, um, Peter actually had a good point. Um, the Watertown Police officer, the Police Department, which showed up and arrested the uh, second Chechen brother in that boat, uh, his point was they were probably not supposed to be the responding department, and they probably saved that young man's life because they were not the hit team. I revealed earlier on the show for the first time that uh, the arresting officer uh, in that case was actually a, uh, a brother of mine in the Marine Corps. I was his squad leader, and he has not been interviewed by Anderson Cooper as a member of the Watertown um, SWAT team. In fact, he was in the Caribbean at that time, so they sent him away, and he's not been allowed to talk to me or anyone else. Well, he's gotten some word out. I've been able to confirm some information, but then the Attorney General for um, Massachusetts issued a verbal gag order, and uh, he's no longer allowed to talk about what he saw. But the point about the radio communications was, yes, the Watertown SWAT team showed up. Perhaps they weren't supposed to show up because I have no doubt that that kid in the boat was not supposed to live to tell his tale. Anyways, you're listening to The Alex Jones Show. I am your guest host, Holland Van Den We'll be right back with Jakari Jackson. Visit InfoWars.com and PrisonPlanet.com. When you're on the site, you can also tune in 24 hours a day to my daily radio broadcast. 
There's also a free iPhone app to listen to the syndicated radio show when and where you want. (laughs) 